Turning up on global business, China's industrial profit decline narrows in June on the back of supportive policies and higher profit margins. U.S. economy recorded a better-than-expected growth in the second quarter, boosted by strong consumer spending. And ECB decides to increase interest rates by 25 basis points on Thursday as Eurozone inflation hovered at 5.5% in June. From CGTN headquarters in Beijing, this is Global Business, I'm Lily Liu. Chinese President Xi Jinping has met with Indonesian President Joko Widodo in Chengdu. Widodo is there for the 31st World University Summer Games opening ceremony. Xi Jinping said China is willing to deepen strategic cooperation with Indonesia and establish a community with a shared future. He called for continued communication between the two countries' foreign and defense ministers. And he said the Belt and Road Initiative and India, in Indonesia's Global Ocean Fulcrum had produced significant results. He said China supports the development of Indonesia's new capital and it is eager to cooperate on new energy vehicles and smart cities. Widodo said Indonesia adheres to the One China policy. He thanked China for supporting Indonesia's rotating chair of ASEAN and maintaining ASEAN's position presence in the region. And he said Indonesia plans to participate in China's global initiatives on development, security and civilization. And the two sides signed multiple cooperation documents. Let's move on to China's economy where profits of major industrial firms in China contracted at a slower pace in the month of June, and that's as supportive policy measures are flowing through to support the recovery. According to China's Statistics Bureau, the industrial profit figures showed that industrial firms above a designated size saw an 8.3 percent drop in total profits on a yearly basis in June. That is a significant improvement compared to the 12.6 percent decline recorded in May. And for the first half of 2023, industrial profits fell 16.8 percent on a yearly basis, narrowing from an almost 19 percent drop in the first five months. Out of the 41 industries surveyed, 30 reported an improvement in profits in the first six months compared with the first quarter. And the equipment manufacturing, electricity, heating, gas and water industries all saw growth in profits for the first six months of the year. China's policymakers have called for more efforts to expand effective demand, boost market vitality and cultivate new growth drivers. Meanwhile, China's top policymakers have vowed more funding support to technology firms, especially startups. On Thursday's routine press conference held by the State Council, Vice Central Bank Governor Zhang Qingsong announced several measures. These initiatives include giving priority to businesses with innovative cap capabilities when issuing new bank loans and facilitating direct fundraising for tech startups on the bond and securities markets. Additionally, the central bank has urged insurance and uh, scrutiny bond companies to participate in the fundraising process to help to manage and mitigate associated risks. Officials and experts gather at a conference to share their thoughts on how to help high-tech small and medium-sized enterprises in talent-seeking. What well, event was held in East China's Zhejiang province. It was also attended by China's Vice Premier Zhang Guoqing and Minister of Industry and Information Technology Jing Zhuanglong. According to the Ministry of Industry and Information Technology, China has cultivated 98,000 specialized small and medium-sized enterprises, as well as 12,000 little giant enterprises. Out of the little giant enterprises, over 10,000 are manufacturing enterprises. Over 40% of the little giants concentrate in the fields of new materials, next-generation information technology, new energy, and smart vehicles. Over 60% of them are deeply involved with the industrial foundation. As the world continues to embrace digital transformation and the integration of manufacturing and service sectors, many speakers from enterprises, academic institutions and other sectors have highlighted their urgent demands for innovative and interdisciplinary talents. This issue has been a key topic of discussion at the subforum, where government officials, academic experts and business leaders have been engaging in lively debates on how best to cultivate and harness such talents to drive business growth and societal progress. 
Based on our own needs and advantages, we have built a technical team of 120 members with talent from both home and abroad for our research and development. We apply the mode of talent enclave. For example, some employees work in Shanghai for our research tasks. This employment mode also applies to some SMEs in big cities like Shenzhen. For recruiting core researchers, we cooperate with universities. They introduce graduate or PhD students to intern in our company and for further employment. As for technicians, we often cultivate them ourselves or send them to professional schools for further development. We will also set up an overseas lab for our foreign experts, so that they can stay in their home country to conduct research with less cultural differences and living habits. As of June thirtieth, more than sixteen hundred SMEs have been listed on the Asia market, about one third of the total amount. As shared at the conference in the first half of twenty twenty three, more than sixty percent of the companies listed on the stock market were from these specialized enterprises. Ho Xin, CGTN, Hangzhou, Zhejiang Province. And the 100-day countdown has begun to the Sixth China International Import Expo, which gets underway in Shanghai in early November. Chen Yiling previews the event. With 100 days to go until the world's largest import event, China International Import Expo opens its doors in Shanghai. Businesses are matchmaking, and deals are already being negotiated. Over 200 enterprises and exhibitors attending the expo are displaying their latest products and also discussing potential deals right up here. Organizers say they expect more Fortune 500 companies and industry-leading enterprises to attend than last year, when participation was limited by COVID restrictions, and many of them have attended the import expo several times. This will be our fifth time to participate the CIE. Uh, I think this year, you, you, as you know, the market uh, is very positive. People are all traveling freely, so we will have a very、uh, busy event this year. Actually, this is the first time we are participating in CIE, and I think this is really a very good chance for us to explore the local markets. We will bring our latest products, which is more focused on the health of the human being. Yeah. Meanwhile, the national pavilion is one、well、of the highlights of the CIIE. After moving online for the past three years, the guest country of honor will resume offline activities this year, and China will have the biggest pavilion ever. The exhibition area of China Pavilion will be expanded to a record 2,500 square meters this year, from 15 square meters previously. The latest achievement of China's high-level opening up and high-quality growth will be introduced, and a zone will also be set to showcase the achievements made in the country's freight trade pilot zones during the past decade. The CIIE also includes the Hongqiao International Economic Forum, which will discuss topics related to the notion of global openness. Over the past five editions of the expo, trade deals were made to the value of 350 billion U.S. dollars. Over 2,000 new products, technologies, and services have also been launched. Forty companies have already signed up for next year's event, investing in what they see. Is a shared future for all. Chen Ling, CGTN, Shanghai. German automaker Mercedes-Benz Group has announced that it is raising its full-year guidance after achieving impressive financial results. In the second quarter, the company's Mercedes-Benz Cars division recorded an adjusted return on sales of 13.5 percent, driven by robust sales of luxury vehicles and premium vans. China remains the automobile manufacturer's largest market, and according to a recent report, Mercedes-Benz saw a 12% increase in car sales in China during the second quarter. And during an in- interview with CGTN, Chief Executive Officer of Mercedes-Benz AG Ola Kalanias described China as the company's home away from home. In your latest financial report, you said that the MB Group is raising your full-year guidance based on your latest financial results. So tell us more about it. We come off of a very strong quarter and actually a, a very strong first half of this year. What's underpinning this is 
is our product pipeline, our uh, product portfolio that is very well received uh, uh, from our customers around the world. So we have momentum in terms of the product and at the same time on the industrial side we have kept our discipline and, and the combination of those two things have yielded strong results and that's why we decided to uh, raise guidance for the rest of the year. And also, what do the numbers tell us about the future trend in the global auto industry? What is your outlook for the industry, uh, let's say, in this, for the second half of the year? And more importantly, within that picture, how is China being positioned in Mercedes-Benz global strategy? For Mercedes-Benz, the, uh, the, the pace that we have had in the first half of the year, we would like to uh, continue that pace in the second half of this year. In, in spite of some uh, macroeconomic challenges uh, in the world, if you look at the uh, three big economic regions with uh, China, Europe and North America. In North America and Europe you have higher interest rates and of course those mm -hmm. moves have been made to uh, control inflation and, and slow economic activity down a little bit. Mm -hmm. China though as the biggest market for Mercedes-Benz is center stage of our strategy. So we are investing into the Chinese market uh, and take a long-term view for growth in China. How would you view the opportunities uh, that China's commitment to opening up is revealing for foreign businesses? And how do you think can Mercedes-Benz contribute to China's pursuit of its own socialist modernization path? The policy of opening up for many years now has been a recipe for success. Uh, so we view the commitment to continue this uh, very positively. and. Uh, uh, when uh, uh, the Chinese uh, delegation under Premier Li Chang was in Germany only some weeks ago, uh, that was reiterated. For Mercedes-Benz, this is good news because uh, we view China also as a home away from home. So we will continue investing in this market and uh, we are rapidly building up, for instance, our research and development activities in China because it's a dynamic innovation environment that we want to participate in and also benefit from. The whole auto industry is in transformation and I think the destination that we're going into is, is true for China but true for the world. Uh, we're going to uh, end up with zero emission vehicles across the board eventually. Uh, the vehicles are being more digitalized so we have more computing power, more sensing that allows us to do uh, autonomous drive but also the digital offering in the vehicles uh, is increasing and the customers uh, are demanding that and especially Chinese customers are very uh, uh, tech friendly. They adopt uh, new technology fast but for Mercedes there are also other let's call them more traditional values that are equally important that customers want to have from a Mercedes and also especially in China. It's the quality, it's, it's how the car rides and drives. Uh, it is that look and feel that if you're in a Mercedes it's almost like you have your own private cocoon. Uh, 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 you feel well in a Mercedes. So uh, we need to combine both. Uh, investing into the new high-tech areas and we're putting billions and billions into this and as I mentioned uh, much of it also in China. Uh, but marrying it to, uh, to our promise for, for modern luxury and that, that's the Mercedes recipe. Uh, the buzzword uh, of this year definitely is artificial intelligence. People are using it for work, for fun. I do that too personally. Could you share with us some of the potential use scenarios for the automotive industry? We have been using artificial intelligence now for uh, many years and uh, the development here is, is very fast and we have seen you know, lately the breakthroughs in uh, generative AI, which opens up yet another window uh, to uh, technical possibilities. I mean, some of the obvious things are, as I mentioned, autonomous drive, that you have learning algorithms that basically uh, think and act like a human, but even with more precision uh, when looking at the environment uh, in which the car moves. Uh, but also uh, in the United States, uh, we were the first manufacturer that put chat GPT, which is the first kind of public uh, gen AI uh, product out there into our vehicles. So customers can speak to the car as if it was a natural person and pretty much ask anything. Those are just a couple of examples, but inside the company to develop, to produce, uh, for smart maintenance, etc., etc. You can use AI for all sorts of things. And still to come here on Global Business. U.S. economy recorded a better than expected growth in the second quarter, boosted by a strong consumer spend. We 
are all connected. Across borders, across continents, connected by ideas, a shared humanity. Stay connected. Welcome back. The U.S. economy grew more than anticipated in the second quarter of the year thanks to strong consumer spending. That is according to data from the Bureau of Economic Analysis. The final reading for the period from April to June indicates that the gross domestic product rose at an annual rate of 2.4 percent, surpassing both the previous quarter's growth rate of 2 percent and market's expectation rate of 1.8 percent. However, during the same period, the GDP price index fell to 2.6 percent from the previous 4.1 percent, while the core personal consumption expenditure dropped 3.8 percent. Now, for more discussions on the latest U.S. economic data, let's cross over to our correspondent, Karina Michelle, in New York. Hi there, Karina. So what are the key takeaways from this bag of data, and how about the outlook for the third quarter GDP? Yeah, excellent. So, I mean, the result was better than expected. The initial estimate for economic growth for the second quarter was expected to show some modest expansion. That after GDP for the first quarter was revised higher to 2% based on exports and a strong consumer. Consumer spending actually accelerated by the highest amount in more than two years. So as you said just moments ago, the Commerce Department released advanced data for second quarter GDP growth and it came in at 2.4% topping expectations. The estimate was anywhere from 1.8% to 2.2%. So this was far better than that. Now stronger than forecast consumer spending as well as robust business investment were some of the catalysts for this. And uh, basically it shows that businesses have been able to weather recessionary fears and remain very resilient. And we've seen that borne out in some of the earnings results that we've seen. Now back here in the US, Investors loving this, futures all pointing sharply higher across all three major indexes on the news. Back to you. Great stuff, thank you very much. That's our correspondent, Karina Michelle in New York. Shifting gears to Europe now, let's take a look at the latest European Central Bank's decision on interest rates. Well, the ECB decided to increase interest rates by 25 basis points on Thursday. That marks the ninth consecutive rate hike, and this brought the closely watched rate to its highest level since September 2008, which is in line with market expectations. And for the past year, the ECB has been working to combat inflation in the Eurozone. And despite a decline from last year's double-digit peak, consumer prices have still risen sharply, standing at 5.5% in June. And this is well above the ECB's target of a 2% inflation. The UN Board of Auditors has reviewed and approved 21 audit reports of UN-related agencies in the 2022 fiscal year. The meeting was held from Tuesday to Wednesday and chaired by Ho Kai, the board's chairman and also the Auditor General of China's National Audit Office. Ho pledged that the board will fulfill its duties and help advance the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres held talks with the board and lauded its role in improving the UN's inner management and governance. Let's move on to some other business headlines that we're tracking at the hour. Germany's forward-looking consumer sentiment index edged up at a minus 24.4 points in August compared to a minus 25.2 points in July, that is according to a survey conducted by Posters GFK. In the meantime, Spain's jobless rate fell to its lowest level since 2008 in second quarter. That is due to a thriving tourism sector. The rate decreased to 11.6% from 13.3% in the previous quarter, as reported by the National Statistics Institute. However, there was a decline in British retail sales in July, with several chains reducing orders placed with suppliers. And the Confederation of the British Industries' monthly balance of retail sales dropped to a minus 25 the fastest decline since April 2022, while expectations for the coming month fell sharply to minus 32 from zero, marking the weakest reading since March 2021. 
In the UK, schools are preparing to close their doors for the summer holidays. This is one of the busiest times of the year for the hospitality industry, but many businesses have not been able to recruit enough staff. One suggestion is to tempt those over 50s who have taken early retirement back into the workforce. Our reporter Li Jianhua reports. Munir Takawi has been running his London coffee shop for about nine years. It was always his dream to own a small eatery, but now he can't find enough staff, mainly due to issues caused by the pandemic and by Brexit. He has to close his shop on Sundays. I think the Brexit has a big part in this. So the Brexit was a big hit for the UK. I think a lot of the, a lot of the European workers, they all left the country. If I have a good team, I can open few branches, but at the moment we, we have a big shortage of labor. Yes, I mean the government they have to do something to help us, so we can grow and we can take the, the business to a different level. Munir is not alone. Vacancies across the UK hospitality industry are now 48% higher than before the pandemic. But there could be a solution. Recent polling suggests nearly three quarters of British pub and restaurant owners would like to attract people over the age of 50 into their workforce. So the first step is come and get some, a little bit of training, come and get a little stepping stone where I feel braver because I've got a little badge where I can know how to pour, pour the perfect pint or make a great drink or carry three plates. So if I can learn some of those skills online, then I'll feel braver about actually applying for a job. And if I can find that job easy and it's around my area, then ultimately it can work around my timings and my, my lifestyle. The global hospitality industry was impacted by the pandemic. The UK is not the only country that is facing labour shortages in its hospitality sector. Over 50s could help fill the gap, but the problem is how to tempt them back into the workforce. A report by the UK Upper House, the House of Lords, found that around 560,000 people in Britain have become economically inactive since the pandemic began. And early retirement among the over 50s played a major role in that. What makes jobs attractive for most people are actually wages. Um, but a small wage increase, I don't think, is going to attract these people back into the workforce, certainly not to go into the hospitality sector. I certainly can't see that the government is going to step in and put any funds to the sector. I mean, the, the government, you know, its main aim is to control inflation. It will do anything uh, to achieve that. So the demand is definitely there for older workers to return to the workforce, but it will come at a price. Li Jianhua, CGTN, London. As China shifts towards green energy and new energy vehicles, the NEV sector has experienced an exponential surge in growth. But that growth has also created a challenge in terms of auto repairs and maintenance due to a shortage of mechanics. In the segment of our series on new job opportunities in China, we explore the specific skills required for NEV mechanics at a garage in Shanghai. With the number of new energy vehicles on the road skyrocketing in recent years, Millions of drivers in China are soon going to need a lot more auto mechanics and backup staff who can fix their new batteries on wheels as well as all the mechanical supports for them. As of now, there just aren't enough to go around. The Ministry of Industry and Information Technology reports China is likely to need at least 1 million more NEV repairmen and technicians by 2025. By that time, NEV owners will need five times more NEV mechanics than the country will have. Many auto repair shops, including this one in Shanghai, have already been running into the problem. More NEV models have come into the market since 2020, and since then we've had an annual growth of around 20% in the number of repair orders. It's quite different from repairing a gasoline-powered vehicle. NEVs have different drive units and systems, and mechanics need to have specific knowledge and skills to manage those things. There's definitely a talent shortage in the market now. And it's not just about learning new skills. Bong says the work requires mechanics to have specialized equipment and tools to work on some NEV batteries and systems, different from usual low-voltage auto-electronics.
For example, when repairing a gasoline-powered car, we have a system called onboard diagnostics that provides vehicle self-diagnosis and reporting capabilities. But when fixing a Tesla, we need specific tools or computer systems to figure out what's wrong with it as it's totally different from its gasoline-powered predecessors. To keep NEV owners from facing long waits to have their cars serviced, experts are warning that more attention needs to be paid to improving current auto repair training. When you're doing the education in the big universities, you need to collaboration further with the industry player, for example, OEM suppliers, because only them have the in-time technology and also knowing where to go and how to go. You need to have the on-track textbooks and the teachers and the course to reflect the current technology growth. You need to have more and more vocational technician school to support this growth. According to the China Association of Automobile Manufacturers, auto production in China reached 10 million units in the first five months of the year, up 11 percent from 2022, with an EV production having gone up 45 percent year-on-year to 3 million units. The problem now is how to maintain this fast-growing an EV fleet on the road. Zhang said it will take the schools working together with industry and fast. Ying Jun ISIS for CGTN Shanghai. And with that, I'm closing out this edition of Global Business here on CGTN. Thanks for being with us. I'm Lulu Lu in Beijing. Till next time, bye for now. This is CGTN, 
China Global Television Network.